let me disappoint you. Uh, I think in all the advertisements that you have seen, it's written Satyarup Siddhanta, ace mountaineer. Well, I don't consider myself as a mountaineer. I am just a common man with little uncommon dreams, and that's it. Dreams. This is what differentiates each and every one of us. Whatever we see around here is a result of someone's dreams. This one, maybe somebody thought, why not do this? And change the slides. Maybe this mic, it's a result of a dream. So, it all started with a dream. I went in 2010 to a hike at Mount Everest Base Camp. And I just fell in love with this mountain. Trust me, I never knew what mountaineering was. I, I just knew trekking. And regarding Mount Everest, I mean, when I was a kid, I have seen in children's book of knowledge, uh, the picture of uh, Tenzing Norge holding a flag with a mask, and I don't know why, why that mask was, but yeah, I knew that, that picture, and uh, I used to question myself why there was no picture of Edmund Hillary on the top. And then I knew that Edmund Hillary and um, uh, Tenzing were the first person to go to Mount Everest, but I never knew. I, did, I didn't want to know what was the height of Mount Everest, uh, which year it was done, because that didn't uh, touch my cord. I mean, it just was there. But when I saw this mountain, it just did a, it, 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 it casted a spell on me. And it was more of an emotional decision that I promised to Mount Everest that I'm going to come back. I'm going to climb, climb you. And little did I knew that <laughs> it takes that much huge amount of money to climb Mount Everest. Little did I knew about the facts and figures. But I'm glad that I didn't knew those numbers, those facts and figures. Because that allowed me to dream that big, to dream of climbing Mount Everest. Now, that dream, when I came to know those facts after reading a book called Into Thin Air by John Crocker, I was devastated. I'm like, oh my God, I was counting that how many years of savings I have to do if I don't touch my salary, how many years of savings I have to do to take the money out to climb this mountain. And, and then uh, I was burdened with the uh, facts and figures. I was very depressed. But at that point of time, I asked myself that, do I want to keep this dream as my wish, which I take along with me to my grave? Or do I really start working towards it? Let's start. I mean, like. Then what I did was, I started <laughs> researching about it, and I thought, OK, I should have uh, a formal training of that. And uh, uh, I just went uh, for a formal training in Himalayan Mountain Institute. And then what happened was, I realized that you cannot have time, health, and money all in one shot. I mean, those who have, I'm, I feel that they are really, really fortunate. But you see. Imagine the students who are still students in college. You might have all the time and all the health, but probably the money part is stopping you. When you are in a corporate, <laughs> you have probably all the health and all the money, but you don't have time. You have meetings, you have meetings. You cannot come to attend the state talks because you're, you have the last minute call and then you come the next day. right? And then, when you become a Ratan Tata or, or whatever, and <laughs> then you have all the money in the world, <laughs> all the time in the world, but you don't have health to go and climb that mountain. So I decided to give it a shot, whatever it takes. I mean, like, the facts and figures didn't matter. I started dreaming. You know, when I uh, heard some of the speakers, when I heard Kunal, Kunal said, it fascinated him, right? Uh, when Ahusha said, it fascinated her. You know, that fascination leads to the dream, and then that dream doesn't become just a part of your left brain or right brain. 
you just become the dream. Your whole body becomes the dream. Every blood screams of the dream that it doesn't allow you to sleep. You don't dream anymore when closing the eyes, but you get up and you know you want to do that. And then I just jumped. And when I was doing some research, I got to know about this concept of seven summits. Climbing the highest mountain of each continent. Oh my God, I can't afford to climb the highest mountain of Asia because it's so much costly. And I'm talking about climbing the highest mountain of seven continents? <laughs> Are you kidding? But then I realized if climbing the mountain was infinite, Infinite plus 10 is still infinite. Infinite minus 10 is still infinite. Infinite into 10 is still infinite. <laughs> climbing one mountain, climbing seven mountains, doesn't matter. Like if I can, if I'm dreaming and it is not costing me to dream, why not dream big? This, these facts and figures and the present situations that you are in often doesn't allow you to dream big. We don't become that kid we again become that old man and we don't want to think, we don't want to believe. We are so conditioned that, no, 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 it's not possible. What am I doing? I'm daydreaming. No, but there lies the key, the key to dream big. Now, dreaming big, does it solve the problem? No. Just dreaming that, okay, I want to be the uh, X and Y, but uh, if I don't act, it doesn't make sense. So, dream big and then make a roadway for that and start small and chase the dream. And then things just become very easy. That's what, equip yourself with the right gears and right skills. I couldn't just uh, thought that, you know, I loved Mount Everest uh, sing in front of me and without skills and thing I started, if I had started going up, I would have been dead meat by now. So, it requests a lot of planning. Uh, uh, this is a picture from Mount Denali where we have to uh, put ice walls to ensure that our tents doesn't break away because of the uh, uh, fierce wind. But then you don't do all the four sides. You analyze the situation, step back. Just don't blindly go and plan. You see where the wind can come from and then just put the walls there. And then, of course, there are a lot of preparation that goes behind, that a lot of preparation, and then you fall. But failure is not falling, my dear friends. If you don't get up, that's failure. Right? And then, when I went to Mount Everest, finally, after a lot of help, a lot of these, a lot of that, after many mountains, in 2015, there was this earthquake. 14 and a half lakh rupees went just like Kunal disappeared some things, that money disappeared. It just disappeared because the expedition got cancelled. And yes, I, I was devastated for, for the time being, but then I wanted to go to base camp to find out, um, is there still a possibility? Is there a refund? Because uh, I, I didn't know what to do because all the money went, went off there. And uh, when I reached there, there was devastation everywhere, everywhere. I mean, broken tents, and I still get shivers. I mean, uh, it's a horrible situation to be in. And then, I was stunned seeing this book. It was falling like that, and it was Tom Clancy's Dead or Alive. And when I saw this book, I, I, I didn't knew, I mean, like, everything went blank, and I, I was wondering whether the owner of this book was still dead or alive. And then, nothing else mattered. I was happy that I was alive. I was, that was the greatest gift. Mountains will always be there. I can again earn something and maybe some companies can sponsor breaking the stereotype things and I can again go back. But that I'm alive is the greatest gift. And then I realized that if I were in that situation like these people who died with a lot of dreams, is it that what I want to do? And I started counting that, okay, if I am too much optimistic about how long I will live, um, 65, 70, 
let's be very optimistic and I say, I will live 70 years. That means another 37 years. I'm 33. And I counted. And I was even more shocked that I have less than 2,000 weekends left in my hand. If you count, you have 53 weeks. And just count by the number of years and that is the most optimistic view of that I can have. So what am I doing with this weekends that I have, do I go party and spend or sleep in the weekend or do I do something productive, do I do something something that I can give back and then everything changed everything changed and it's just like if you have a pocket in your pocket you have 2000 rupees would you spend carelessly? you will not you will spend every week, every, every, every rupee you will spend very judiciously and then all the fears of like what will happen to my money, whether I'll go back and what will I do because I left my job because of that and I, I mean like then everything didn't matter at all. And then while coming back, I managed to collect back the broken pieces of the dreams which was all scattered around. I brought every piece of them and then again I knew from, from my uh, deep inside my heart that I am going to come back, I am going to come back if not tomorrow, if not day after tomorrow, someday I'm going to come back. And then even uh, when I came back, I thought I had two choices. Like, do I uh, sink into that uh, grief that I lost that much money or do I do something? And I chose the latter and I went to Australia and climbed the highest mountain there. Yeah, of course I had to borrow some money from my friends, my credit card again <laughs> tossed up. But yeah, then I didn't allow those limiting beliefs, those pity to engulf me. I just went ahead with the flow. The acceptance that yes, come back from the denial phase and accept the fact that yes, it's gone, then what's next? What's next? And then when this thing happened, even the next door neighbor of mine thought to write a book, Thousand Reasons Why Not to Go Everest. <laughs> because it was so deadly and I had even another thousand reasons why not to go to Everest. But had I not gone back to Everest, that would have been failure. I had at least one good reason why to go back to that Everest. And then I again prepared and the old uh, proverb is there, the ship is safe and harbor, but that is not where it is meant to be. And I started my journey again this year and started all the practice, all the practice in uh, base camp, of course the uh, belly that you are seeing here, it, it just vanishes uh, two months before my any expeditions. And yes ma'am, I, I am, uh, I, I love sweets and, uh, but I also ensure that I have a balance. Yeah, and uh, then, when you have this, the avalanches. We used to run out from our tents in the night. It used to happen. It used to happen any time in the day. Then, after some time, we could see face to face with our fears. Because when we see avalanche, we used to remember the previous years, and that is to cripple us. That is to that fear is to cripple us. And then, when you see this Kumbu glacier, so many facts on this glacier, so many people died, so many these, that, like 2014-14 uh, shapers died, 2015, 22 people died in the base camp alone, and then it lies in front of us. But then again, when you look at the beauty of it, every facts and figures just vanishes. And you just see in awe, and you have to accept that we knew from beginning, before we started the journey, that it's not easy. If it's, uh, it were easy, anyone and everyone would have come there. Since it's not easy, that's why Everest is Everest. And there is no shortcut to the success. Whatever you saw uh, previously, when we actually go inside, it, it takes more than 10, 10 and a half hours to cross this whole thing. It, those are the people. Uh, you know, and these this ice blocks are very, uh, what do you call, uh, shaky. Like any point of time, if you sneeze, it can fall off on yours. And these are like towers. When I'm talking about ice blocks, is that big towers of ice blocks, like two-storied building. And it has, those are like all tilted. Any point of time, it can fall off. But 
there lies that beauty, there lies the silence. And then you go inside, and then you address the fear, then you start love, loving it. And then you get trained. You get trained to cross those uh, things in training um, uh, all those parameters kept in, uh, in the loop. But you are trained in control environments. In the actual, it just becomes like this in the night. But then you become yourself. You don't think about what can go wrong. You can think that, okay, why, you, you, whatever you can get are only some memories that you can cherish forever. And that adrenaline rush, it actually helps to steer you even forward towards the goal. And then when you go to look around and I have seen it looks like an eagle and it's natural and trust me not even the best of the sculptures, sculpturists or the architects can make that kind of structure in the middle of nowhere. It's, that is what we get when we just leave our comfort zone and go there. Like you know, nature doesn't <laughs> send you empty handed, like you know, it teaches, it teaches you a lot. And then, finally, you reach the summit. The top of the world, beyond which no human being can go because there is no place to go. mountains which initially we used to look up like that now those mountains used to look like that those are like the problems that we typically see as big as Mount Everest but when you are there those problems just vanishes and becomes Lilliputs like the other mountains so now that you have seen this and we have just I think I can take some more minutes uh, <laughs> uh, who do you think cannot climb Mount Everest? You know, you need to have, now you have seen the dangers that can lurking around. You need to have very strong eyesight, like sharp eyesight. You have to see what are the crevices. You have to see, you have to have strong legs, you have to have strong arms, and you have to, I mean like, you have to have strong lungs, right? Isn't it? I can't hear. Do you disagree, anyone? No, right? But let's see some facts and figures which I always hate. But sometimes it helps. An 80-year-old kid, why I say kid? Because if he was not a kid, he couldn't have made it. He would have conditioned that, no, my old age, my this and that, and I, he couldn't have ever made it to even the best camp. But he had that kid inside him. And salute to this guy, and at 80 years old, climbed Mount Everest. Difficult, but not impossible, right? A 13-year-old adult, if she would have um, thought like a kid in that, in her scenario, probably she would have thought, oh man, this is for <laughs> all the big shot people. But see, he, the, uh, she, uh, Malavat Purna, she is from India and she's a pride that at the age of 13 years, 8 months, she climbed Mount Everest. Difficult, but not impossible. Arunima Sinha, a national level volleyball player. She was traveling in a train and she opposed some goons who were misbehaving and they threw her from a running train. She lost her limb. When the whole world should have crumbled down that time and she showed that grit and she showed that what is that highest level of endurance any, any human can do? And she thought, yes, I want to climb Mount Everest, why can't I? And then she did. With just one leg, trust me, it's not easy, I have been there Initially, I had a thought like, you know, anybody can uh, pick you up on, on your shoulder, like, you know, how so many people, uh, so many people who have never gone to mountains come on TV and say that, oh, nowadays anybody can go to Mount Everest. But it's tough. I have seen Sherpas uh, falling in front of me to their death. And I was traumatized. And that she did with one leg. Difficult, but not, not impossible. My friend, 
Sian Sonner, he was attacked by cancer twice. His, one of his lungs was to be removed because of that and he went ahead and climbed Mount Everest. Can you imagine with one lung climbing Mount Everest? And he did it. He just broke everything, everything. Right? And then a blind man, not only did he climb Mount Everest, he, cl he climbed all the seven summits. Hats off, I mean, like, can you imagine the level of passion that this guy has? Right? And then yesterday I was talking with ma'am and uh, I was so happy to see someone who has met this gentleman named Reinhold Messner. When the whole world believed that nobody can ever go to Mount Everest without oxygen, without supplemental oxygen, this guy was the only person standing alone and he knew from the core of his heart that it's possible. And he just turned deaf to all other people who were saying, no, it's not possible, it's not possible. Because he believed it is possible. And then, in 1978, he was the first person to climb Mount Everest without any supplemental oxygen. Can you believe it? One man's thought changed everything. And then, I know what it is uh, to go to Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. Because in the last ridge, when I was climbing this time to Mount Everest, my oxygen mask failed. I was at 8,800 meters. It's just like, it's not that you cannot go without oxygen, but there is a different preparation for that. You go without oxygen and there. But for me, I was already taking oxygen for one day and suddenly the oxygen supply is cut off. And I was there for half an hour without supplemental oxygen and when we had to change those carabiners, I put my thumb like that and I couldn't bring it back. And I knew that I was dying. But fortunately, the sun came up after some time and the uh, water vapor block uh, went off and I could breathe again the supplemental oxygen and I was, I'm standing here in front of you to talk <laughs> rather than be a memorial service uh, telling that our ex-student <laughs> was dead. But, but I know like such superhuman effort, but you know the power of mind, if you can conceptualize that and if your whole body becomes that idea, that dream, Everything else doesn't matter. Everything becomes possible. And that takes a humongous amount of courage and courage to question and challenge the status quo. Why can't I? Why only uh, Sachin Tendulkar can hit a six? Why can't I also try to play and do that? Or I mean, like, it, it's just magical, right? And you might say that those are history book people, like, you know. Uh, I was an asthmatic patient. Till my college days, I couldn't go without my inhaler. And uh, from there, today, I am climbing the highest mountains in the world. It's not impossible, right? Yes, it took its own time, it took its own uh, checks and balances to get rid of it. but. The thought that I have to get rid of it, the thought itself breaks the limitations, the self-limiting beliefs that cripples us, right? So if that is possible, friends, I think everything is possible only, not if I believe in you, not sir believes in you, but only if you believe in yourself, things are possible. And with that, dream big, and dreaming big alone won't help, chase your dreams. Thank you.